I'm Peter Lindstrom, the chair of the Environment Committee. And uh, thanks for all of you for joining us here this afternoon. And uh, this is our this is my inaugural run as chair of the uh, Environment Committee for the Met Council. And um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, uh, fellow council members, for uh, being willing to serve on this committee. And I, I think we're going to do some great work in the weeks and months uh, ahead of us. And so with that, let's uh, just launch right into the agenda. The first item is item is the approval of the agenda. Are there any <clears throat> corrections or additions to today's full agenda? Move approval. Motion has been um, made to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed uh, say nay. Carries unanimously. All right, and that takes us to the approval of the minutes. And I believe Miss Wolf was the uh, uh, only one at the last committee meeting. So. Yes, Mr. Chair. Since I was the only one there, I will move approval of the minutes as written. All right, fantastic. We trust you. Motion has been made. Is there a second on that? I'll second because I trust Wendy. All right, fantastic. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay carries unanimously. Okay, that takes us to the business portion of our agenda, where first up is 2019-60 uh, JT, the City of Newport, 2040 Comprehensive Plan Review File number 21915-1. Mr. Coleman, welcome. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Environment Committee. Uh, just for the record, my name is uh, Kyle Colvin. I am the uh, manager of the Engineering Programs Group in Environmental Services. And one of the responsibilities of the Engineering Programs Group is uh, the regional wastewater system planning. So as part of uh, or one of those responsibilities is to review the local comprehensive sewer plan and verify that it's consistent with the policies and uh, the regional wastewater system plan. So, uh, the first, uh, it's my pleasure to be here and introducing the first uh, agenda uh, to the committee. Uh, I want to start off by um, uh, summarizing that last year uh, we had uh, two comprehensive plant sewer plans that came in for review and approval. And at the first uh, environment committee, uh, I made a presentation and solicited uh, comments in terms of the format and the duration and the information that is contained. Uh, in these presentations uh, with the hope that uh, it provides the information that the committee members are looking for in these presentations. So uh, after, after the presentation, I would again like to ask uh, for any input and suggestions and information uh, that, uh, that the committee might like to see in future presentations. Uh, I made the, um, uh, I, I presented at the committee of the whole meeting last week and indicated that uh, there's approximately 125 of these plans that will need to go through this committee. And as I indicated, we only have two to date that have gone through. So 2019 will be a, a fairly busy uh, schedule for us. Um, given that uh, the duration of these uh, presentations are fairly short, uh, it's, it's very likely that there may be some future committee uh, agendas that might have 10 or 12 of these individual items coming before it. So brevity was one of the things that was stressed at the last environment committee. But again, I'm open to suggestions for future presentations. So uh, with that, I'd like to start right in. Um, you'll notice that this is a joint business item. Uh, comprehensive uh, uh, plans uh, go through two committees. Uh, the environment committee uh, acts on the wastewater plan. Uh, it takes a separate action. It, it formally approves the wastewater plan, whereas the Community Development Committee uh, takes action that, uh, that authorizes the community to implement the remaining sections of the comprehensive plan. So hence the reason for the two uh, agenda items, uh, the joint uh, business item. Uh, once it goes through both committees, then the item goes before the council, which then takes action uh, that's, uh, that's reflective of the recommendation of both committees. Uh, the, this item is scheduled to go to the Community Development Committee next week on Monday at their meeting. Uh, there's no policy or specific requirement that these go before the Environment Committee first versus the Community Development Committee. It really, uh, the timing is, uh, comes down to the 
the review period of time that we have and whatever fits best in the, in the committee schedules to get that through that 120-day uh, that review window. Uh, last, uh, the last committee did uh, highly suggest that the, the sewer plans, uh, or that the, that the item goes to the environment committees first, but there isn't anything that specifically requires that, uh, that um, order. So with that, I'll dive right into the plan summary. Uh, the city's uh, original uh, community planning designation uh, as reflected and identified in Thrive in the community's 2015 system statement identified uh, Newport as an urban community. And by uh, the policy by Thrive, an urban community uh, needs to accommodate uh, future development at the residential dense sewer densities that's no less than uh, 10 units per acre. Uh, however, the city, through its comprehensive plan, has requested that uh, that its designation be changed to that of a suburban community. And according to Thrive, uh, a suburban community requires sewer development at a minimum of five units per acre. And the reason uh, for the request uh, by the city is that uh, uh, challenges in the topography of the community, basically related to steep slopes and river bluff areas, and uh, the number of high number of environmental sensitive areas such as the lakes, wetlands, and shoreline areas make achieving uh, the residential density of 10 units per acre very challenging. Uh, they also cited that market conditions and the fact that sufficient uh, transportation access to new developed areas at 10 units per acre would be, would be a challenge for the community to uh, to uh, incorporate into their plan. So therefore, the council staff has taken, uh, after taking these uh, considerations into account, uh, has agreed to support the city's request to change their planning designation to the suburban community. A uh, little summary for the, uh, regarding the community. New, uh, Newport is located in the southwest uh, portion of Washington, uh, Washington County. Uh, it's located in Council District 13. Uh, its wastewater plan is consistent with the growth forecast that the Council has assigned to the community. Uh, it also, the plan reflects its ability to accommodate this growth through a combination of new development and redevelopment within the community. Its land use plan guides residential land uses that reflects an overall minimum sewer residential development density of 6.3 units per acre, so it satisfies that minimum sewer development density of 5 units per acre. Uh, the plan states that the city currently has 78 uh, subsurface sewer treatment systems or uh, septic systems uh, within the community. Each one of those serves an individual specific community. Uh, the city has generated excess peak wastewater flow discharges uh, into the regional uh, wastewater system, which has resulted in the assignment of an I, I mitigation work plan to the city by the council. As such, the city has been identified as a contributor of excess I, I to the regional wastewater system. Since 2011, the city has completed more than $460,000 in local I, I mitigation work, uh, with over half of that work being funded through multiple state bond grants administered by the council. The majority of the work completed by the city has been focused on public infrastructure uh, improvements, but they have also completed some private property work. It's also important to note that state bond monies can only be put toward uh, work on the public side of the wastewater system. Uh, the plan includes policies, strategies, and goals for I, &I reduction in both the public and private portions of the wastewater collection system. And it includes an ordinance that prohibits the connection of downspouts, rain leaders, and sump pumps to the sanitary collection system. Planning done by the region and the communities within it clearly supports thrive-driven outcomes and principles. Sound asset management principles have provided a framework for stewardship of the wastewater system that supports a prosperous region. The wastewater system protects public health and the environment. The management of our wastewater systems has led our region to sustainable practices such as best management activities to our infrastructure assets and inflow and infiltration programs to name a couple of examples. This work is ongoing and will continue in the foreseeable future. 
the principles of integration between wastewater, local wastewater service needs and the ability for the regional wastewater system to provide service is reflected in the city's plan and its local INI mitigation work collaboratively supports the council's regional INI mitigation program. The plan reflects the three C's. Last week we talked about the three C's that we look in every plan. Uh, the plan conforms to the regional wastewater system and that future wastewater service levels needs can be accommodated through the regional wastewater system. It contains policies that support and are consistent with the regional wastewater policies and it's compatible with the adjacent community and other governmental units. So it satisfies those three C's. Uh, it satisfies all of the required plan elements as specified in the uh, regional uh, water policy plan. And as stated in the conformance statement, uh, the regional wastewater system has or will have sufficient capacity to provide the service needs uh, for the city as projected in the plan. There are also two advisory uh, comments uh, that are in the business item. Uh, these are standard to all plans that come through the council uh, for action. Uh, the plan needs, uh, the plan will become effective after the city officially adopts its final 2040 plan and the city is required to submit a copy of the city resolution that adopts that plan. So with that, the proposed action before the committee today is that the Metropolitan Council adopt the advisory comments and the review record and approve the proposed recommendations of the Environment Committee as written in the business item, which includes the approval of the City of Newport's comprehensive sewer plan component of the City's 2040 comprehensive plan. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and then also take any suggestions on what the committee might like to see in future presentations. Any questions for Mr. Colton? Council member. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just have a point of uh, information question, but I, on the St. Paul Park, uh, is that is that considered the emerging suburban edge? I don't know, I just couldn't tell by quite exactly the color if, if that is or. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. Uh, St. Paul Park would also be a um, a suburban edge. So a suburban edge community is one that uh, in terms of its land development patterns would be a little less urban, if, if you will, than what a suburban community would be. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Colvin? Is there a, a motion? Move approval. We'll second that. Motion has been made and has been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. <clears throat> Carries unanimously. Thank you very Thank you. much. Appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Chair? Yeah. He asked for feedback on the presentation. Can, may I make a couple Please do. comments in the way of feedback? The, the Thrive slide with all the bubbles is probably superfluous. And uh, one other standard question to answer would be, is there room in our current interceptor system for the growth that's projected in the community's plan? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Wolf. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll um, eliminate the Thrive slide um, uh, in light that um, it'll save you from seeing it 125 times. And uh, also in, in regards to uh, the system capacity, yes, that, that is one of the things that, uh, that we do take a look at. Uh, looking at um, the city of Newport's growth, the system does have adequate capacity to, to accommodate that growth. Thank you, great feedback. Any other questions? Okay. And that takes us to our next uh, agenda item, which is related to telecommunications equipment contract for the regional wastewater treatment plants. Um, Ms. Heflin, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. And Members you're bringing props with you. I like it. Yes, sir. <laughs> it helps to communicate. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Environment Committee. My name is Renee Heflin. I am manager of Plant Engineering Technical Services. Um, my group implements capital projects at our wastewater treatment plants. 
I'm here to present business item 2019-64, telecommunications equipment contract for the regional wastewater treatment plants. New telecommunications equipment is needed to make our existing plants control systems ready for Wi-Fi technology. As listed in the business item, the equipment includes access points, um, which are basically receivers for wireless data, switches, which are connections into the plant networks, and then also controllers, which manage data flow. The prop I, bought is, uh, I brought is actually um, an access point, and it just shows the antennas that will um, receive wireless data. This would be an example of one that would be mounted to a ceiling, say in a building or in the tunnel, and then it could pick up the wireless um, data. Whoops. Um, last year, we completed installation of Wi-Fi infrastructure at the Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant. This business item furnishes telecommunications equipment for the remaining seven wastewater treatment plants other than the Metro plant. And the equipment will be installed under a separate contract which has already been you know, awarded to a company called EIM in the amount of $1,520,000. On February 20th, 2019, quotes were received for the new telecommunications equipment for the regional wastewater treatment plants. The lowest responsive and responsible bidder um, bid was submitted by CDW Limited Liability Corporation in the amount of $1,280,787.24. One more time for the drive slide. But, uh, <laughs> this work, I couldn't do anything between Kyle and myself, but uh, <laughs> I will for next time. This work uh, supports the Thrive outcome for a stewardship efficiently and effectively preserving our regional wastewater treatment plant assets. On that basis, uh, staff recommends that the Metropolitan Council authorize its regional administrator to award contract 18P156 in the amount of $1,280,787.24. To CDW Limited Liability Corporation for the purchase of network equipment, which includes access points, switches, and controllers. I, I guess I'll start off uh, with a question. That one thing I know, just at about a fifty thousand or maybe a hundred thousand foot level, is um, the SCADA uh, is. I imagine you have some sort of uh, a SCADA type system, and does this equipment play into that? Um, is it important for the for SCADA? It's very important, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're starting out with, this is the um, infrastructure, and we're starting it out, out with uh, being able to uh, gather the monitoring data. We do have a distributed control system at each of our uh, uh, plants. Um, and as we go to the um, wireless technology, it's really all about a, um, a mobile control room. It yeah. uh, saves a, a lot on the operator time and um, on the installation of cabling. Um, we're going to start out with the monitoring uh, data. We have like um, one I can come to mind at Metro Plant, the sludge blanket um, uh, level monitoring. We won't control right off, but it's it's very important. I think that's, we all think that the uh, wireless technology um, is our future, and so we're moving in that direction. So if we want to make real-time decisions, you got to have it on your on your, your device or on a screen in front of you ASAP. Yes, Mr. Chair, and, and not have to go back to the control room to see or hear it or interact to give it commands. We want um, real-time and field, field response or capability. Makes sense. Thank you. Questions from the council? Commissioner, Council Member Wolf. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, last year, the ES staff did a lot of work on being able to do maintenance and whatnot with iPads. You know, you know instead of taking a paper form out there and a big workbook of how you do things, they could do everything on the iPad and, and communicate in real time on that as well. So it just makes sense that if you're going to be able to do your work on an iPad, you have to have the communications infrastructure in place, but it is uh, uh, doing great things for workflow for our employees as well. Great point. Council member? Jerry, I had a few, few questions if I may. Um, so the first of all, it looks like you know, we have two bids here and I was just wondering what kind of uh, information or marketing that we do to get uh, bids out on this project. Seems like a low amount of bids for this type of work, but maybe it's difficult one. Please. Mr. Chair, we use the state contract uh, to request quotes uh, from vendors that supply um, equipment which uh, meets uh, national standards that, that we need um, to meet because we're critical infrastructure. Um, so we actually uh, um, solicited from four, um, and then we turn that over. We turn our quotes received over um, to review internally, and we were confident that these two are responsive and responsible and competitive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I, and I was just wanting to, uh, with these bids, they, they looked at both uh, employee safety as well as the security uh, of these systems, like going with wireless. Are those, uh, those are presented in the proposals as well? Uh, Mr. Chair, I need a little bit of help on the quote for uh, uh, responding to safety. I'm well, just wondering, like, uh, just to explain, but like sometimes there's some talk about like wireless, uh, there's more uh, frequency of waves that it, it can affect uh, employees' health and people. You know, there's some some type, like even 60 minutes of that, a different book microwaves that was affecting uh, people that are using them to affect their, their health. So I just was wondering if the health was there. And then also the security part is with the wireless, uh, it's not as secure as a, like a hardwired uh, line typically. I don't know if those were presented in the arguments at all with the, the systems here. I'll try. Just have fun. Um, Mr. Chair, I would um, address the security uh, first. Those are some of those uh, national standards that I said we would, uh, that we are specify so that the security is uh, not a question for the <clears throat> equipment that we're um, purchasing. And we, we are very concerned. We, we take very seriously the security of our plant control system, so that's um, not. And on the health part, I'm not sure. Um, Roger, would you? Um, so Roger Rabine is the project manager, um, and he's also an um, instrumentation elect electrical engineer. As far as the safety goes, uh, I guess what I'll say is it's really no different than probably what we have in this building, in this room. You go anywhere these days, and it's the same type of Wi-Fi signal, the same, uh, it's the same strength. So if it's an issue elsewhere, yes, it would be an issue here, but there's nothing different that uh, uh, on this one that would uh, amp it up, uh, make it more powerful uh, than, than what we already experience everywhere we go. So, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good questions. Other questions? Thank you, Chair. Hudson. Uh, did you say you have this technology already at the Metro plant? Okay. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chair. Very good. Excellent. Other questions? Okay. Is there a motion to award contract 18P156? I'll move. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second? Has been made. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And that takes us to our third agenda item, which is 2019 65 ratification of declaration of emergency for repair of Rosemount Interceptor 
2112 and 9208. Ms. Clancy and Mr. Gordon, Mr. welcome Chair. to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Janine Clancy. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Technical Services, and we're the group that manages the capital program as well as wastewater system planning and the cost allocation model. And Adam Gordon is here with me today. He is the man Manager of Interceptor Engineering. And uh, we're here tonight to present to you a ratification of a declaration of an emergency repair at our, one of our at two of our Rosemont facilities. Um, we don't often present uh, emergency declarations to the council and to the committee. And tonight on your agenda, you have two. So it's a little unusual. In most years, we have about a handful uh, because we work really hard to uh, prevent any need for an emergency declaration. So before we get into the details, I thought I'd just quickly give you an overview of the process and some examples that we've had in the past. So first of all, the purpose of the emergency declaration is to address in a, a situation in which the health, safety, or welfare of the public or the safety of Metropolitan Council employees or facilities is compromised or could potentially be compromised and requires immediate action to correct. So in 2018, we have a couple examples. We had a fire at one of our wastewater treatment plants and we had to declare an emergency to put that, the, the system back in order, excuse me, in order for facilities and operations. We also had a um, failure of one of our interceptor systems due to the corrosion of the pipe. And the condition of the pipe was, um, was impacting the integrity of, of a state highway. So we needed to address that immediately. Uh, we had a failure in a carbon system that was creating an odorous situation in a neighborhood that we needed to address in, immediately. So those were some of the examples in, in 2018. The next slide uh, gives you an overview of the declaration process. So the first item, obviously, is that the infrastructure concern is identified and investigated by MCES staff. Um, and sometimes we get notifications from some of our customer communities or one of our transportation partners if they see something particularly in our interceptor system that they've noticed when they're um, doing their observations of their infrastructure. So then there, then there is a determination made that carrying out the competitive bidding process prescribed by the council's procurement policy would unacceptably delay the commencement of work to repair the facility. So then an emergency declaration document is prepared and signed by the general manager. So in this particular case, the action before you, I prepared the emergency declaration. I believe that the assistant general manager for operations, Mike Marinas, prepared the emergency declaration for the flood preparations. After the review, the emergency declaration is authorized by the regional administrator who has delegated authority pursuant to the council's procurement policy. And then a contractor is selected and work begins under the direction of the council authorized representatives. So over the course of the years here, you'll hear often the term council authorized representatives or CARs. We have our own staff on board that ensures the process and the integrity and the specifications of our work are carried out to our best interest. They, they observe the contractor's work and represent the council in the field. And then subsequently, uh, the, the emergency declaration is ratified by the Metropolitan Council if the cost to correct the emergency exceeds $100,000. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Adam, who will over, give you an overview of the um, Rosemont situation. Thank Mr. you, Gordon. Janine. And Mr. Chair, committee members, I'm here today to present a business item for the ratification of the declaration of emergency for repair of Rosemont Interceptor 7112 and 9208. So in this slide, we have a location map. Uh, routine inspections of the MCS interceptor system discovered two locations in Rosemont where the MCS pipe is in need of immediate repair. The first of these pipes is on Interceptor 7112 in Rosemont, just west of Highway 52, where the MCS pipe crosses the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. 
Site visits have confirmed that there's a hole in the bottom of the pipe, as well as a separated joint where the pipe connects to existing manhole structure. This condition is allowing pipe bedding soil materials to flow into the interceptor and potentially affect the surrounding property. And you can see from the photo, there's a uh, section of pipe hole that's several feet wide by several feet in length that is missing from the bottom of the pipe. The uh, second location is on Interceptor 9208 on the south side of County Road 42 near the Dakota County Technical College. The pipe in this area appears to be overloaded and is at risk of collapse. You can see from these photos that it has a it has an egg-like shape that's starting to flatten out on the top of the pipe. A project to remove and replace the pipe is needed to prevent adverse impacts to the area and adjacent Highway 42. So we've come up with a repair scope and estimate. Engineering in that uh, scope includes engineering services and support to repair the work. Uh, Inter Interceptor 9208 and replacement of 500 feet of lineal uh, pipe, a 36 inch diameter, along Interceptor Sunday 112, installation of new structure and rehabilitation and replacement of the 48 inch diameter segment of pipe. That's the one with the hole in it. Uh, both areas need temporary uh, wastewater conveyance and dewatering work, and then there's surface restoration work. And the total estimated for the two locations, the two separate areas, is $1.2 million. And the cost of the work will be funded out of our 2019 MCS authorized capital program. I have to do this at least once. <laughs> so this action advances the Thrive Outcomes for stewardship. Public financial resources will be invested efficiently and effectively to maintain and restore existing capacity to existing wastewater infrastructure, which protects our region's natural resources. So our proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council ratify the justification for the declaration of emergency for repairs to Interceptor 9208 and Sunday 112 in Rosemont which attached to, is attached to this business item. And I would be happy to take any uh, questions from the committee. I have a question. Um, how do you temporarily convey? I knew that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a simple question, and I'm sure it's not a simple answer. Yes. I mean, how do you... We'll have some pictures coming up, yeah. Oh, you... How do you do that? Oh, good. We have pictures coming up. <laughs> the, <laughs> the best way I can explain it, we can never turn off our wastewater, Mr. Chair. Yeah. We can't back people up. We can't spill it on the ground. It's kind of like repairing your garden hose that has a leak in it without ever stopping watering your gardening. Um, it involves making connections upstream and downstream. In this case, we pump the flow temporarily around the bad section of pipe so we can get into the pipe and do our work. And then we have to uh, convey the flow back into the pipe. So you'll hear over the next year here or so, um, quite a bit of talk about temporary conveyance. It's one of our major expenses in any repair in the interceptor system. Wow, thank you. I'd actually love to see that actually oh, you'll get a with good my own eyes. That would be, that's fascinating to me. Um, Questions? Yeah, I have a question. How, how much of this is age related? Not not our age, but the age, yeah. um, the age of the interceptors. And is there a way of, of projecting? And maybe this is all built into how you do your budgeting. But is there a way of projecting when when sections are going to need to be replaced? Mr. Chair, uh, actually, these two sections of pipe are not that old. They were constructed believe in around 2005, 2006. I'm not quite positive about that, but they're, they should not be failing, but they are failing. Um, and there's many different reasons. I can't answer to you why they're failing. Um, 
And one of the things we'll do is we'll have uh, geotechnical support on site when we excavate mm -hmm. to see if there was problems with either the bedding or how it was constructed to better determine and take some lessons learned from this. Mm -hmm. um, the pipe uh, that is collapsing is a, is a flexible pipe by nature, but it's not that flexible. Um, and it's very difficult to actually place that kind of pipe. And we've learned a lot over the last 10 years about how to use that pipe. Mr. Chair, I have a follow-up question. Thanks. What, what would be the normal lifespan of, of this pipe? Uh, the normal lifespan of the collapsing pipe would be more on the better than 40 uh, I've heard projections as far out as 80 years okay. for that type of pipe. It's a fiberglass mortar pipe, which should have a very long life. The concrete section of pipe, it's not as unusual to find concrete pipe that will deteriorate. And uh, if you give it, put it in a bad situation, if it has uh, either corrosive conditions or bad uh, bedding or external corrosion going on. So we're not quite sure in this case why that piece is missing, but we're going to find out as we get down to it and fail to replace it. Other, other questions? Uh, Mr. Councilmember Stern. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, you went through some of it a little bit, but just wondering is uh, when you find the break, is it uh, more where it's a manual inspection, it's electronically where that goes, is it, you know, like the customer experience that they, you know, the smell, that kind of thing, but where do you normally find it and how often is like routine maintenance or in case of payment, you know, they have payment management programs going and right. those type of things. But. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. So we do have a routine, what we call CCTV, or uh, we video, basically videotape all of our gravity sewers. Um, and we've been through the process and are continuously videotaping sewers. So we caught this on a, a routine videotaping and we're able to see that we had the defects. Thank you. So you just continually, you have 600 miles, you just start at one end and you just kind of do a continuous we, rotation. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we, we do try to rotate through. We have, a, we have constraints that we don't start one end and go to the other. We'll, right. we'll jump around to the higher priority areas first. Council member. Uh, Mr. Chair, could we ask for a report uh, when engineering is done? Uh, can we get a report back uh, from uh, to figure out uh, kind of what the root cause was and uh, if we're learning from uh, this error or this uh, uh, early uh, failure or, well, it's a year, year early uh, replacement. Correct, and, you, and you're talking about the pipe replacement, the one that's um, overburdened or the, the egg-shaped and uh, the one put in in 2005-ish. Um, once you come to some sort of conclusions on what, why you think it's failing, uh, that would be interesting for, to, for the committee to, to know more about. And I'd be curious to know if, are there, were there other similar pipes placed around the same time mm -hmm. that we anticipate could have problems in the near future? Hopefully right. not. Yes, Mr. Chair. So when I started my career 30 years ago, I was putting this same type of pipe in. Um, so we know is we have a track record that's fairly good with this type of pipe. So yes, we, we do have to go through that root cause analysis and find that out. And I'd be pleased to bring that forward. Thank you. Well, Council member. Anyway, just got another one. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so speaking and just look at the repair part of it, uh, it repair typically it may be something damaged. It. Is it possible that, uh, you know, the, what would you say, that the, the property owner may be backed into something? Or do we know, like, why the repair, which is something that caved up with cold weather or what have you then? Right. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, probably unlikely because it's over a 500-foot length of pipe. So it's not a point that could have backed up into something. It's also an open area that's just adjacent to the highway, and there hasn't been any activity in that area. So we're really suspecting it might be something with the pipe bedding or the soil conditions that led to this. Okay, thank you. Other questions? 
some follow-up needed, but um, in the meantime, we have to do these repairs. So we're looking for a motion. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, I have one more right question. Here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want this to create a, a skirmish at all, but does the proximity of Flint Hills have any impact on this? Um, not that I know okay. of. I mean, it is near Flint Hills, but we have access to all the property. Um, so that's not an issue at this okay. point. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Council members here. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move uh, business item 2019-65. Uh, Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Good presentation. <clears throat> and that takes us to our fourth business item, which is a sole source purchase of goods and services from Evacua Water Technologies Incorporated. Mr. Marinas. I hope I got that right. Marinas, you did very well, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. I am Mike Marinas. I'm the Assistant General Manager of Operations. And I am here to talk to you about, uh, uh, to present business item 20, 19, 66, which is a sole source purchase of goods and services from Evacqua Water Technologies, Inc. This map is of the seven county area, and it shows the, uh, our interceptor collection system, which is, consists of 610 miles and assorted facilities, which in a later presentation, which you're gonna see me a lot today, I'll go into a little more detail about our collection system. Um, obviously we collect and convey uh, wastewater from communities and take it to one of our eight wastewater treatment plants. To control odors uh, out in the system and to control corrosion of the sewage on our uh, conveyance system, we have for many years added a liquid chemical that uh, we call nitrate salts and or, and or we call it bioxide. So you'll see on the map in front of you bioxide sites. So we've had a successful program for a number of years. If you can see the key on that map, you'll notice that there's 15 locations in our collection system where we're adding this liquid chemical to the sewage that's flowing by. And again, for the purposes of controlling odors and um, reducing the corrosive impact uh, on the conveyance system. We have contracted out for these services for years. And the contract has been with Evoqua, Evo they're our current vendor. Uh, to provide the nitrate salts, which is to provide the chemical. And then what's important is as part of the contract, they also provide the equipment at the 15 sites and the equipment will include storage tanks for the liquid chemical and it will include the pumping and distribution equipment as well as they provide services. They go out and add uh, chemicals to the uh, system, they change the dosage as needed, they ensure that everything's working fine. So as part of the original contract, again, Evoqua uh, bid and was a successful bidder to provide the, uh, the uh, liquid chemical as well as the storage tanks and the chemical delivery equipment at the sites. <clears throat> This has worked out good, and then subsequently we've needed to bid other contracts. Well, what's happened is because Evoqua put in the original equipment, they have a competitive advantage over other suppliers of the liquid chemical. So we've 
gone through a bidding process here in recent years where we've gone out, we've um, pursued competitive bids, but we come back with Avoqua has this competitive advantage and therefore we're not getting um, uh, responsive bids from other suppliers. We've taken a look at other alternative chemicals to add to broaden out the field, if you will, to provide the same sort of services or the same sort of benefits that nitrate salts do. And we have not come up with a good alternative for that. So to get us out of this box, what we're recommending is to execute a sole source procurement for nine months to Evoqua. Um, and during that period of time, we're gonna take a, determine a new bidding strategy that will allow for a more competitive bidding process with more companies involved. We'll try a different Thrive approach. <laughs> so the Thrive Lens Analysis for this Stewardship, so the public financial resources will be invested efficiently and effectively to maintain proper operation of the Metropolitan Disposal System, protecting the region's natural resources. So the proposed action before you today is that the Met Count Metropolitan Council authorize its regional administrator to execute a sole source contract with the Evoqua Water Technologies, Inc., Inc., not to exceed $2 million to provide nitrate salts, odor control equipment, and odor control services to the Interceptor Services Business Unit for the period of May 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020. And I'd be glad to take any questions. Questions for Mr. Renus. So Fred's, we'll start with uh, Council Member Fred's and work our way this Thank way. You, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just inter interested to know why why oxide sites are located where they are. I'm looking at like Ramsey County and there doesn't appear to be any in Ramsey County, maybe a cluster around Lake Minnetonka. Could you see more? Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, we've determined these are strategic locations that will uh, most likely generate odors or have generated odors in the past and or have presented some corrosion problems for some of our conveyance equipment through there. So not every pipe and not every location necessarily provides those conditions, but like I say, these we've determined are uh, optimal locations. Thank you. Council member. Okay, thank you, Chair. I, and I think you kind of alluded to some of it, but I was wondering if you've uh, looked at maybe in bringing it in internally or working with a company for in training or some of the local Voltec uh, companies who provide a program where we internally you know, buy the chemicals from a source and we have the expertise internally with uh, Met Council. Mr. Mr. Green, Chair, we are looking at providing some of these services internally. So, but it's more along the lines of, like I say, right now, Evoqua provides some of the chemical storage equipment and uh, uh, pumps. Uh, we are looking at providing our own chemical storage equipment. So that would pull that out of the contract. As far as having our own staff go out and tend to the pumps and um, adjust the pumps and respond to changing conditions. We could do that, but we've found with the contract and with the expertise that Evoqua provides that it's a better business decision for us to have them provide that service. And they can be quite responsive when there's changes that need to be made. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Member Vento. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, is industry trying to find an alternative to the nitrate salts? There are alter, Mr. Well, Chair. Please. <laughs> there are alternatives out there. We just have not found one that uh, uh, provides as good of a um, service for us. And okay. service for us not only includes 
minimizing odors and uh, corrosive effects, but it's also a cost issue. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, seeing none, we're looking for a, a motion uh, to authorize the regional administrator to execute a sole source contract with Equova Water Technologies. Is there a motion? Move approval. Motion's been made. A second? Second. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. Thank you very much. And that takes us to our last uh, business item, which is 2019-67, ratification of declaration of emergency for flood mit mitigation <clears throat> at environmental services wastewater treatment plants. Mr. Marinas, again. Mr. Chair, committee members, floods are in the headlines, and this uh, business item is related to that. It's also a chance for us to provide a little background on our flood situation and our flood preparation. <coughs> so in the next few minutes, uh, I'd like to cover, go over with you the location and service areas of our treatment plants that are most affected by uh, rising rivers. I'd like to talk a little bit about the flood forecast and how we look at that. Uh, I'd like to talk about the Metro plant and the preparation uh, activities that have been done and are being done as we speak. Give you a little uh, flashback, take a look at the Metro plant for some of the past floods that um, we've dealt with there. We'll take a look, it's not only about the Metro plant, we'll take a look at the regional plants. There's three regional plants that really are having to respond to the current flooding. And then ultimately, we'll get to the uh, ratification of the emergency declaration. Let's see if I can make this technology work. <laughs> so there's, there's really four plants that we are focused on. So the Metro plant is right here on the Mississippi River. St. Croix Valley plant is right here on the St. Croix River. The Hastings plant is right here on the Mississippi as well. And then the other plant where we're really doing flood preparation activities is the Blue Lake plant. So this map, seven county area, at some future discussion, I can get into the different colored areas. Um, but anyways, that's those four plants are what we're interested in. How'd they do, Susan? So uh, again, because our plants are located uh, close to rivers, we are very in tune to what the spring forecast is for the rivers. Um, so we're one of many agencies that are um, uh, tied in with the National Weather, Weather Service and um, watch closely their predictions for floods or their projections for floods for the coming spring. So we last got an update from them on March 18th. They actually are working off of data from March 4th. This is the way they work. They kind of get all their information over the winter, going into the spring, and then provide this projection. But, I'll hit a few highlights that uh, their report showed. So this was as of March 4th, some of the typical spring flood factors. So the soil moisture, for those of you who recall, we had a wet autumn in 2018 and it left the soil moisture above normal before the freeze up, especially across Southern Minnesota. And I talked about some of our plants are in the Minnesota River. What I've found, and I've watched this over the years, a lot of what happens in southern Minnesota and in the Minnesota River Valley plays into what happens to the river right outside our front door. Frost depth. Uh, frost depth, two to four feet frost depth over the entire region. It's a fairly deep frost. And the thaw hadn't started as of March 4th, 
The frost depth is important because as the water or the snow melts, can it, can it percolate into the soil or is it going to quickly run off and find its way into the creeks and ultimately the rivers? And then the snow pack or the snow water. As of March 4th, it was well above normal. There was about two and a half to four, hand, four and a half inches of a widespread area with some five to six inch reports in the Minnesota headwater areas in western and northern Wisconsin. This ranks as a historically high levels for early March. So things were kind of teed up for a um, potential flood season. So one other slide from the National Weather Service, what they call snow water equivalent ranks. So they go out and not only measure the depth of the snow in the region, but just how much water would be contained in that snow uh, when it melts. I think the thing to take away from this slide is that the darker the blue, the more it lines up with historic levels of snow water equivalents. So the, the darkest blue shows that it matches up with some of the highest snow water equivalents recorded in history. And you can see there's a lot of dark blue, a lot of a little lighter blue, et cetera, across much of Minnesota. So what it says is that there's plenty of energy out there, or they call it fuel, for a potential flood. So this one, and I'm an engineer, so I'll try not to get too buried in the details. That said, I think I need to unpack it a little bit. Uh, and I probably have to use the graphics a little bit. So we'll see how this works. So the National Weather Service prepares these and they prepare them every spring. And this one, we call this the probability exceedance chart. And this, in this case, this is for their river gauge here in St. Paul. It's really located right at Robert Street there. And it's about the Mississippi River and its likelihood of reaching certain levels. So, um, and, it, and then we can use this to produce or to project the potential risk to, in this case, the uh, Metro plant, because it's just downstream of this. So a couple of the takeaways. So the blue line at the bottom that is 60 years of historical data that says, on average, over 60 years from the, basically the March, April, and May period, with 60 years of what I would consider normal conditions during that period, that's the chance, uh, that's the line that shows the chance of exceeding certain levels. So. One way to take a look at this then with the blue line. So what's important for us at the Metro plant, when the river gets high enough, it does not flow out by gravity to the river. When it gets high enough, we have to turn on large pumps that essentially lift the treated wastewater out of the plant to the raised river. So these boxes on the left, you'll see start effluent pumps at 10 feet uh, four inches, and those are just flood stages for us. That's an important uh, parameter for us when we have to turn those pumps on. So if you were to look at the blue line and went across, you'd see that in a normal year or across 60 years, you might have about a 40% chance or four out of every 10 years, we'd be turning on those pumps. So what's important for us, though, is this year, this spring, and the, the black line with the triangles, that's the conditions based on what I just described to you before that they're seeing out across Minnesota. So with the line, obviously, above the blue line, it is saying that there's a greater chance that we're going to run into higher water. So let's take a look at some of those other boxes 
along the, uh, the Y axis, the left axis. So again, it says with near certainty that we're gonna have to turn on our effluent pumps and lo and behold, we turned on our effluent pumps here uh, about a week ago. Yeah. So for us, the next thing that really gets to be problematic at the Metro plant is the Child's Road. And I don't know if you've been to the Metro plant, Wendy has, but the entrance to the plant is on Child's Road and it's a relatively low lying road. And when the, when the river gets high enough, that road will flood out. That's a problem for us. We are in the business of treating wastewater 24 seven. So we've got plans that can get us into the, into the plant. And I'll show you some pictures about how that happens. But we're very interested on, are we gonna be in a position where child's road floods? So again, let's look at this probability chart and let's look at the black line. So if you follow the child's road one, and go over and then come down, it's saying there's about a 90% chance that the river is going to rise above Child's Road and flood it out. And lo and behold, in the last couple of days, the river has done that. And we've imp implemented our mitigation plan um, to deal with that. I won't spend too much more time, but the other couple of boxes there, again, they're important um, uh, stages for us. Uh, maybe the most important one, and we'll talk a little bit, there's a flood, flood wall around the metro plant. And you can see the top of the flood wall is up at a height where there's, it's, it's not predicted that under any scenario, we're gonna see river level get to that, uh, that high. So this again is created by the National Weather Service, put out in the spring, and this covers the March through uh, basically May time period. And what's different about this chart is it gives you a little bit more of a timing function. So if you look at the x-axis, it's the dates, it's, it's the weeks, March 11th, 18th, 25th, etc. And then for the y-axis, it gives you a sense of the probability of reaching certain levels. So again, I've got some important stages uh, for the Metro plant on the uh, left-hand side of the slide, starting the effluent pumps. According to this, <clears throat> and again, this was put together back on March 4th, we probably would be starting the pumps this week. Like I say, it worked out for us late last week, we started the effluent pumps. If you look at the Child's Road um, box, uh, it's predicting that this week there's a 25 to 50 percent chance that we would be, uh, that Child's Road would be getting submerged. And indeed, like I say, just a couple of days ago, Child's Road started to go underwater for us. So we at the plant use the previous chart and this chart to really uh, strategize preparing to mitigate any flood problems. What I will say then is, um, and I've, I've been with the uh, organization for over 30 years, we have dealt with a lot of floods, and because of that, we're good at dealing with floods. We've got a well-prepared and well-developed flood plan. Our flood committee every year in January pulls the flood plan out and gets together, looks at if it needs to be updated, starts looking at projections. Some years that committee, all the work they do, doesn't have to be implemented, but we want to be prepared. Obviously, we're in the business of providing continuous service in regards to wastewater treatment, and the way to do that is to be able to hold, hold the rivers at bay. So as far as the metro plant flood preparations, there's a lot of activities that take place, but some of the highlights, emergency generators. 
Our plants are very mechanically complex plants that use a lot of electrical energy. We have a reliable feed of electrical energy, but because we're very dependent upon it, particularly when I talk about those pumps that are lifting the flow out of the plant, we need to be ensured that we have backup power available if the unforeseen happens. So we have emergency generators on site. They're well maintained. We have plenty of fuel oil for them, et cetera. The Child's Road ramp, again, I'll show you some pictures and it'll make more sense for you, but it's our way of dealing with when Child's Road goes underwater. Sandbags and stop blocks. <clears throat> Sandbags, self-explanatory. When I saw Renee brought a prop, I thought I should bring a sandbag, but uh, <laughs> maybe next time. Stop blocks, we just have openings in concrete walls where we can slide logs in that basically block off those openings to um, stop the water from coming in the plant. Meetings with neighboring businesses. On Child's Road, there's a number of business, businesses that share Child's Road with us. We need to co coordinate with them, their activities, our activities, when Child's Road looks like it's starting to shut down. Coordination with city and county emergency offices. Uh, the roads, not only Child's Road, but Warner Road, Shepherd Road, et cetera, coming to the plant, we need to coordinate with the city of St. Paul and Ramsey County. Uh, when are they planning on closing down those roads? What are the alternative routes? We need to have a well-coordinated plan with them so that uh, the public and our employees can get around safely. Increase critical process chemical inventory. Our plants use a lot of chemicals uh, to process wastewater um, and we have uh, truckloads coming in almost every day when Child's Road is open. But when Child's Road is not open, obviously that becomes a problem for us. So we'll top off all of our chemical tanks and what we frequently do and we're doing this year, we'll bring in tankers of our important chemicals and we'll just park them on the plant site inside the flood wall. And if we need more of that particular chemical, it's right there for us. And then provide 24 seven electrician coverage. So again, I talked about the importance of the electrical feeds to our equipment, particularly those large pumps, we call them our effluent pumps. We wanna have electricians on site. If we lose the electrical feed to the plant, yes, we have generators, but we're talking about a rather complex switchover from uh, line feed to the generator feed. And we wanna make sure we've got experienced electricians there to make sure that happens without a hitch. This is an aerial view of the Metro plant. In the lower left is the Mississippi. In the upper right hand corner, that body of water is Pig's Eye Lake. And this is uh, during a drier time of the year. So the Metro plant's 140 acres. It's surrounded by a 10,000 foot flood wall. Basically on the western half of the plant, it's a concrete uh, wall. And on the eastern half, it's an earthen dike. Now when the Mississippi rises, uh, Pig's Eye Lake is basically a backwater for the Mississippi. And that little blue pond up at the top there uh, basically uh, fills in all of the upper portion uh, uh, on the east side of the metro plant. So just to give you a feel for, excuse me. Just to give you a feel for the floods at the metro plant, uh, we've got some pictures from the archives, if you will. Uh, this was the 2001 flood and that's been the highest we've had in the last 50 years. And I've, I'll have a chart that shows you kind of relative flood levels over the years. Uh, this would be, you're up on Dayton's Bluff looking south down at the Metro plant. Um, I think that's, uh, you, and then you see a little arrow pointing out the plant there. 
This again is 2001, obviously right over the Metro plant. So a couple of features I'll point out to you here. So we talk about the barrel. So the, the um, flow coming to the plant comes from the north and the Metro plant is a large plant and the pipes coming into the plant are large. Um, and the top of the pipe coming in is basically the width of a good size single lane road. Plus it's elevated about nine feet above the level, the normal level of child's road. So it's a, it's a good avenue for us. It's a good high avenue for us to get our employees into the road, uh, into the plant. And again, we'll talk about the temporary ramp that we build to use that. But if you look at this photo, you see the barrel clearly out of the water and you see the metro plant high and dry, but surrounded by water. And then on the, on the uh, upper side of that photo, you'll see home and field. One thing I will tell you that's changed since 2001 is home and field got tired of their runways getting flooded out and they put in a flood wall. Um, I think about five, six years ago. So again, I talked about the barrel and wanting to get to the top of that. Well, we need to figure out how to get ourselves to the top of that or get our vehicles to the top of that. So we just build a temporary road right over Child's Road that our employees can drive from a it's really an exit ramp, a higher exit ramp to Warner Road. We can get off of that ramp, get onto the temporary ramp, get us on top of the barrel and safely drive into the plant. We have about almost 300 people that call the Metro plant their home base. Um, not necessarily all of them there need to be there all the time, but many of them do. And obviously our uh, critical employees need to get into the plant. So this is their constructing the uh, temporary ramp. So hard to tell, but on the right would be the ramp that would take you up to Warner Road. On the left is the barrel or the top of our pipe. And then obviously they're taking gravel to build that uh, temporary ramp. And at this point in time, Child's Road, which they're on, was not flooded out. This would be you're on the, the temporary road looking towards the barrel and you can see now Child's Road has some water on it. Same sort of view here, just stepping back a little bit, letting you see even more water on Child's Road. Talked about the flood wall, the concrete flood wall. Um, it's been in place since the early 70s and it's worked just fine for us, uh, again, to keep the river at bay. This is some of the uh, historical flood levels that we've had over the years. And the largest flood, or the highest flood, if you will, was back in 1965 which I am, I'm having a tough time reading. I think it's 26, um, but uh, in recent years, and again, I've been with the organization for about 30 years, the highest flood level we've seen is, again, what I've been showing you from 2001. I believe that says 24. Uh, just to give you some perspective, this year's flood, at this point, the projected crest is at about 20 feet. And then I've drawn a line in there when uh, Child's Road or the level of Child's Road and when it would start to go under. And there's a bit of variation on that depending upon some conditions. But just to give you some sense again, numerous times over the last 30 years and in particular over the last 15, we've had Child's Road get flooded out. I talked about the 1965 flood being the highest level for us. They called it the flood of the century. Uh, and here is a, uh, a picture of the same sort of area. The Metro plant is in the upper left-hand corner. What I will tell you, and I think this photo was either taken before the crest or after the crest. 
Um, the Metro plant in 1965 did not have a flood wall around it. And the plant became inundated with flood water. The admin building where I had my office had is, is somewhat elevated and it had about four feet of water in it. Uh, we have tunnel systems throughout the Metro plant and the tunnel systems obviously got flooded with water. A lot of equipment got damaged after the floodwaters receded, it took a long time to get the plant back up and operating. So the people that were in charge back then made the decision to build, plan, design, build a flood wall. And like I say, it went up in the early 70s and it's handled, uh, handled the floods just fine since then. What I will tell you with the 65 flood is the flood wall could have handled seven and a half more feet of height on the 65 flood and still been fine. As you can see, the, the barrel is still uh, still above the water level. Like I say, I think this was before the crest. That's a lot of focus on the metro plant. Like I say, we have three other plants that we are concerned about. Maybe I can do that from here. Oh, I better get up there. <laughs> So this is our St. Croix Valley plant, on, obviously on the St. Croix River. They have some different issues and some different uh, stages that come into play for them. Um, and again, you can see that for the St. Croix River that the conditions from this spring are much higher than the historical conditions. So we would expect some problems there. That said, St. Croix actually sits pretty high and we have not had to do many um, mitigation measures at this point, and the crest, the projected crest, shouldn't cause us much problem. This is our Hastings plant, obviously down in Hastings, just right outside the uh, downtown Hastings. Um, that plant's a little more, and that plant's on the Mississippi, and it's a little more susceptible to flooding. So some important uh, parameters for us is when we have some empty tanks on site, you're worried about tanks that'll start floating because the groundwater or the flood water comes up into the plant, and those tanks will want to just actually start floating, and that'll cause a lot of structural damage for us. We're projecting a crest of about 20 feet for this plant, sorry. Um, in which case then we've already started to fill up the empty tanks. We're doing some sandbagging around some low lying areas. In general, it's not, um, how should I say it? It's not a difficult plan to mitigate the flood, but it's something we're keeping a close eye on. <coughs> And finally, the last plant we're looking at is our Blue Lake plant. Our Blue Lake plant's located on the Minnesota River, not far away from uh, Valley Fair. The Blue Lake plant is uh, projected to have a crest of about 32 feet, so right about here. Um, actually, we're watching the river. The Minnesota River seems to be have reached its peak and seems to be coming down. We've really had ideal melting conditions over the last 10 days. Uh, obviously no extra rain. Uh, some nights have been getting below freezing. So uh, the river seems to be headed in the right direction, but at 32 feet, we have large pumps at Blue Lake as well that lift the flow out of the plant. So we started up those pumps again about a week ago or so. And that, uh, the plant staff's doing a great job of handling those flood conditions. Oops. I forgot, Susan. <clears throat> so again, a little background on our flooding. That said, um, we did have to declare an emergency for some flood mitigation services for our treatment plants. Uh, 
uh, referencing the business item, I'm not going to, I've already talked about kind of the spring conditions and how it's ideal for flooding. I think I've talked about, we need to build the temporary access road across Child's Road for access to the plant. There's costs associated with that. Um, additional costs that come up because the Metro plant isn't readily um, accessible with Child's Road. We have to send some industries that bring us liquid waste to another location near the metro plant on higher ground. We need to provide security services for that site. Plus we provide security services um, out on Warner Road and in our plant to direct traffic across the barrel. Those are all extra costs that we don't have in our operating budget. And then between the, uh, the metro plant and other, other facilities, there's some miscellaneous things that you might expect. Again, extra sandbags, maybe, maybe some portable pumps. Uh, we bring in uh, porta potties for some of the different locations where we've got security staff uh, stationed 24-7. Thrive lens analysis. This action advances the thrive outcome of stewardship again. Public financial resources will be invested efficiently and effectively to maintain proper operation of the metropolitan disposal system, which protects the region's natural resources. As far as funding goes, the cost of constructing temporary road access on Child's Road is estimated at 75,000, uh, providing additional security services for the metro plant plus potential miscellaneous materials and services at other MCS facilities to uh, mitigate fl the flood is estimated at about 50,000. And then this would be provided out of our operating budget. So the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council ratify the emergency declaration attached to the business item. Uh, for flood mitigation at environmental services wastewater treatment plants. I would be glad to entertain any questions. Mr. Marinas, did you say the additional cost is about $50,000? Mr. Chair, $75,000 to build the temporary road, $50,000 for miscellaneous supplies. Again, sandbags, portable pumps, things of that nature, for a total of $125,000. And does this ratification enable you to spend that money or does it enable you to um, spend the money not following the traditional procurement rules that the council has? Mr. Both. Chair, the latter. Kind of moving forward quickly without going through Correct. the standard Correct. procurement. We, we need to respond way. quickly to these conditions, even though we, like I say, we can look at advanced projections, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Also, member. I live in the south end of Maplewood, so I frequent Warner Road, and I know exactly where Child, Child's Road is. And I'm wondering how much consideration has there been um, for just permanently raising Child's Road? Mr. Chair. Child's Road is a city of St. Paul uh, road. We, we don't control that. I have not been involved in any discussions with the city of St. Paul uh, about doing that. I, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> One matter. more question. I can't believe I asked it because it always seems like there's some form of road construction going on in that stretch. So. Um, I may regret having asked that question someday. The, the second question I have is, um, and I, this, while this isn't directly related to the Met Council, how much of an impact is there on the railroad there? Mr. Chair, yes. there are, there's a railroad yard right there adjacent to Child's Road. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of railroad, uh, I believe they're maintenance facilities right there as well. Um, their access to their facilities is compromised. Mm -hmm. We work closely with them, and uh, I think for one of the facilities, they actually come across our barrel mm -hmm. to get access to their facility. You know, that said, I, I'm certain there's a lot of rail line in that area that gets flooded out and it's just unusable for a period of time. Other questions? 
Seeing none, is there a motion to move forward, forward with ratification for the emergency declaration uh, for flood mitigation at environmental services water, wastewater treatment plants? So moved. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, all in favor say yes. 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 All opposed say nay. Carries unanimously. Well done on that preparation. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and that uh, concludes our business agenda, and that takes us to information. Mr. Marinas. I believe we have a presentation. Absolutely. Perfect. On a lighter note, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, throughout the year, several of our employees receive awards and recognition from the various associations, both locally and nationally, that support our industry. Obviously, we are proud of these employees and their accomplishments and want to publicly recognize them and bring these achievements to your attention. With that in mind, we have three of our employees who've done a great job and uh, supporting the Minnesota section of the American Water Works Association, or AWWA, and have recently been recognized for their work by the AWWA. Here from the AWWA to present the awards, our Minnesota section chair, Minnesota Section Chair Eric Volk. Eric is the Water Superintendent at the Elk River Municipal Utilities. Also here is the Minnesota Section Chair Elect Bill, and I'm apologize, Bill Schnoes. Schnoes. <laughs> Bill is the Public Works Director at the City of Wake Park. Our award, and also here the awards co-chair co Carol Plummel Johnson. Carol is the Utility Superintendent superintendent at the city of Apple Valley and finally Andrew Sullivan here. Andrew is a, a utility operator with the city of Eden Prairie. The, the Andrew Sullivan Award for Outstanding Leadership is named after Andrew. Should I advance? You can give me the heads up and try that. Hi Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thanks for having us here this afternoon. Uh, Andrew wasn't able to make it. Oh. <laughs> Andrew's here. Oh. I didn't see him sneaking. Don't say anything bad about him. <laughs> All right, scratch that part. All right. This afternoon, we're, we're proud to recognize uh, Dave Brown, Bert Tracy, and Carol Jasinski for their tireless efforts and outstanding service to the Minnesota section of the American Water Works Association. This is a historic event. Never before have three outstanding individuals in the water, water industry been recognized at the Met Metropolitan Council and all three at the same time. The American Water Works Association wants to thank you for your commitment to clean water. We'll start with Dave Brown. Uh, Dave Brown, in September 2008, at the Minnesota American Water Works Association Annual Conference in Duluth, Dave was recognized with the past chair award at the end of his one-year term as a section's chair. In September 2019, he will complete his three-year term on the Minnesota section executive board in the three chair roles of chair elect, chair, and past chair. In addition to his executive committee volunteer position, Dave has been an active member of, of the American Water Works Association serving as secretary treasurer, assistant secretary, and numerous other section committees. He has provided exceptional and exemplary service to the water industry in the role of consultant, advocate, and partner. He supports and encourages all AWWA members to volunteer their time, talents, and energies. The Minnesota section of the American Water Works Association is honored to recognize Dave Brown with the Minnesota section past chair award. Congratulations. Mr. Chair and committee members, I really want to thank you a lot uh, being in AWWA has been a great experience for me over my career. I've been involved since the early 2000s. Um, just in the last several years, too, of being here at the council, I've just really seen the recognition of the council's involvement in AWWA and the city's getting to understand Met Council's commitment to the utilities. I see us building better relationships with all the different utilities in the metro area and in the greater state of Minnesota. So thanks again. I appreciate that you give me the opportunity to spend time in the organization. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next we'll move on with uh, Bert Tracy. 
We're tracing September at the American Water Association Annual Conference in Duluth, where it was presented the Leonard N. Thompson Award. The Leonard N. Thompson Award is the highest section award presented by the Minnesota section of the American Water Works Association. The award is presented annually to one member for their distinguished service to the water supply field in commemoration of Leonard N. Thompson. Mr. Thompson worked for the City of St. Paul for 52 years and served as general manager for nearly 34 years. Leonard Thompson stands alone in Minnesota section in longevity, service to his community and service to the water industry. He loved his work and he devoted his entire, and to it he devoted his entire life. The Leonard N. Thompson Award was established by the North Central Section in remembrance of, his outstand, of this outstanding individual. The award is made annually to the Minnesota Section member who typifies the standards that were emblematic of Thompson's contributions to the section and the water supply industry. Each year, the Thompson Award Committee of the Minnesota Section reviews the eligible candidates, determines if any member of the section typifies the standards that were characteristic of Mr. Thompson's contributions to the section and the water, the water supply industry, including longevity, service to his community, and service to the water industry. The Thompson Award Committee felt that Bert Tracy's performance exemplifies these traits. Bert's contribution and service to AWWA and the water industry includes, he's been an active member of AWWA serving on the executive board and chair of the Minnesota section from 2009 to 2011. He has served on numerous Minnesota section committees, including but not limited to the awards committee, conference committee, and district trustee. He has provided exceptional and exemplary service to the water industry for over 30 years with numerous cities within the metro area and currently Met Council. He supports, encourages, and delegates people in all areas of the water industry to volunteer their time, talents, and energies. He is a mentor and advocate. The Minnesota section is honored to present Bert Tracy to the Leonard and Thompson Award. Congratulations, Bert. Mr. Chair, committee members, um, it's quite an honor to get this, and I really appreciate AWWA recognizing the uh, Met Council employees in front of this committee. So thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right, and last but not least, we have Carol Kaczynski. Carol Kaczynski was recognized at the annual conference in Duluth this year with the Andrew Sullivan Outstand Outstanding Leadership Award. The Andrew Sullivan Outstanding Leadership Award is presented to an individual or group for exceptional service that demonstrates initiative and dedication to the drinking water profession above and beyond the scope of volunteerism. Carol has, to provide, Carol has provided leadership, exceptional service, and tireless efforts to the water industry as the STEM committee chair, uh, involvement in numerous committees, a conference staple, every year you can rely on her, never ending energy and commitment to the section, association, and utilities industry. And she, Carol is really the epitome of what a uh, volunteer should, should be. And a little side note, we just found out yesterday that Carol's STEM committee that she headed up about a year ago was, is going to be recognized nationally in Denver this year with Ooh. the American Water Association. Yay. So wow. that's, <laughs> thanks to Carol, this will be the first time our section will be recognized for that award. Wow. Uh, the Minnesota section is honored to recognize Carol Kaczynski with the Andrew Sullivan Outstanding Leadership Award. Thank you. I really am honored for this award, and I really appreciate the Met Council's continued support. And I'm relatively new here, and I just want to thank all of the people who have helped um, make this a great experience. Thank you. Minnesota section. Uh, the AWA would like to thank the Metropolitan Council for their support and encouragement <clears throat> for Dave, Bert, Carroll, and other council employees to be involved in the community, water, water industry, and the American Water Association. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much. Thank you. I heard uh, uh, words like commitment and mentoring and advocate and outstanding leadership and um, 
boy, I, we benefit so much uh, by your outstanding commitment. So thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's great to have you on board. And with that, that takes us to our next information item, environmental services 101. <laughs> Maybe we should have had this at the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> Probably a good suggestion, Mr. <laughs> Again, my name is Janine Clancy. I have two of my colleagues here, um, Sam Paskey, who is the Assistant General Manager for Environmental Quality mm -hmm. Assurance, and Mike Marinas, um, the Assistant uh, General Manager for Operations. Um, I'm gonna do the, start off with the overview, and during the overview, I'm going to introduce a couple <coughs> more members of the executive team uh, who are also in the audience um, and recognize them as well. So we put together this presentation and would like you to recognize that uh, we have a number of orientation sessions following. So this is a high level overview to get you started and then we'll take deeper dives as the, as the year goes on. There's a lot to learn about us. So our topics include about MCS, our planning authority, um, a bit about our system, which Mike has covered quite a bit of um, already in his flood presentation. Um, an overview of our finance and our capital program. So here is our organizational chart. Um, of course, we're an operating division of the Metropolitan Council. We have three primary roles. The first and, and probably the role that takes, and, and not probably, the role that takes uh, most of our staff time is that we provide regional wastewater services to municipal and industrial customers in the region. We also provide planning and technical assistance for surface water planning and water supply planning. Some of the awards that you saw today were about our water supply planning efforts. Our vision is to be a valued leader and partner in water sustainability. And this reflects the emphasis that we place on regional partnerships that we have with our customer communities to ensure clean water and adequate water supply for a thriving region for generations to come. So the chart before you shows uh, the on the bottom uh, in the, the bottom tier and the second to the bottom. Uh, first of all, environmental services is headed up by our general manager. Of course, you know her, Lisa Thompson. We have our finance director who is not here this evening, uh, Ned Smith. He'll present a, a deeper dive into finance at a later time. We also have our director of administration, Karen Neese, who's responsible for internal communication, supports our HR. <coughs> um, also in the audience, we have an assistant general manager, Larry Rogacki. Larry, can you stand? Uh, Larry heads up our support services unit that includes groups such as industrial waste, process engineering, um, process computer, and sustainability, among others. We also have uh, our maintenance director, Dan White, who provides security services, electrical services, um, facilities maintenance, and, uh, and uh, vehicle maintenance as well. Um, and then again, we have technical services, operations, and EQA. So the regional wastewater system, ownership, operations, and maintenance of the regional waste, wastewater, wastewater system, again, presents, represents the majority of our work. Our regional wastewater system protects public health and the environment and fosters the economic growth of the region. That's our purpose statement, and it's, it's pretty darn significant, is uh, the protection of public health and the environment, and through that, fostering the economic growth of the region. We serve the seven-county metropolitan area, 109 communities, soon to be 110 communities. We serve over 2.7 million people. The amount of people that we serve represents just under 50% of the state's population with the regional wastewater system. So we have a very significant impact. We have eight wastewater treatment plants, and Mike will talk about that a little bit later. 610 miles of large interceptor pipes. Those are the pipes that intercept wastewater from the community collection system and transport it to one of our eight wastewater treatment plants. We treat 250 million gallons of wastewater every single day. Our organization consists of over 600 employees. Our assets are, at seven, are valued at $7 billion. 
And so to keep those assets in good working order, we invest about $150 million a year in our capital program, which represents a, a little less than 2% of the value of our assets. So that might seem like a lot of money, but when we have the systems that we have in place, we have to keep them in good working order. So wastewater treatment and conveyance in the Twin Cities metropolitan area is performed as a partnership between the council and our customer communities. And I can't stress that enough. We succeed when our communities succeed and they succeed when we succeed as well. The wastewater system is incredibly interconnected. We have 7,500 miles of privately owned service laterals that connect homes and businesses to 5,000 miles of community-owned local collection systems. These collection systems then connect to 610 miles of MCS interceptor sewers that convey wastewater to the treatment plants. So our communities are our customers, but they're also our partners. Yeah. Grab three and roll it. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, again, I'm Sam Paskey. I serve as the Assistant General Manager for the Environmental Quality Assurance Department in Environmental Services. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about planning today. We're, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, Kyle spoke originally about a plan approval, so this is part of that process overall. Um, as the regional planning agency, you've been briefed on this, no doubt, to some extent already, um, we are responsible for planning, but also for operating several regional systems. And in doing so, we coordinate extensively with cities, counties, watersheds, state agencies, and many others to ensure orderly economical development in a livable Twin Cities region. So this is a very high level scan. Um, we'll have a deeper dive coming for you soon. Um, so the overall structure, um, but we are guided here, and this committee deals expressly with the Water Resources Policy Plan. Um, that plan is the guiding policy and planning document for our division, um, and it fits into the Metropolitan Area Development Guide, which is derived MSP 2040, um, the slide you've seen many times tonight. You won't see it here, I believe. Um, and that framework is, again, all about the orderly economical development of our region. Um, the Water Resources Policy Plan also includes policies in the Long-Term Wastewater System Plan. Um, guided by this plan, our staff, our division, works with 109 customer communities, as Janine mentioned, and 800 industrial customers. Um, we also interact with local city and watershed um, surface water management staff, over 100 water suppliers, and state agencies to ensure sustainable water resources and growth for the region. So that water resources policy plan on the slide has those three aspects in it, wastewater, surface water, and water supply. It's updated every 10 years and it sets our regional direction regarding water resources and defines how the wastewater system grows. Um, those three sections are integrated in this iteration of the plan for the first time. Um, the water supply component is guided by an additional document, the Master Water Supply Plan, uh, which is separate and it provides a framework for good planning by the region's local water suppliers. Um, this is a remarkable statement I'm about to make. Um, the Water Resources Policy Plan, that document is guided and directed by a state statute. Um, and the direction in that statute is that this document must help achieve federal and state water quality standards, provide effective water pollution control, and help reduce unnecessary investments in advanced wastewater treatment. That's a, in a statute, I can give you the number if you'd like. Um, this links the management of point sources of water pollution like wastewater treatment, um, which are expensive, and non-point sources of water pollution like stormwater runoff links them together for better, more cost-effective results. And the region has many stories to tell about how that approach has, has paid off over time. Um, again, a deeper dive later. Um, the, the Environment Committee members um, and the Council Chair serve on several water-related committees. The Metropolitan Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, MOSAC, 
which also has a technical advisory committee, uh, the State Environmental Quality Board, and the State Clean Water Council, both of those latter two are ex officio roles. Um, there's an animation there. Um, on to regional planning. So regarding the, the wastewater system, items that come before this committee are critical to the operation of that system as, as you've seen. Uh, today you've made several decisions that sustain the very existence of a lot of that infrastructure. Over eight, the last 50 years, that system has been consolidated from 30 plants down to eight. Um, and our region is proud of one of the highest performing, lowest cost systems, wastewater systems in the country. It's a remarkable system. You'll hear more about that in a minute. We achieve this by linking our work to very clear objectives that benefit the region, including sustainable operations, a proactive approach, responsible financial stewardship, protecting public health, safety, and the environment, and striving for excellent customer service. And we're very proud of the outcome, which is sustainable communities served by a responsive, high-performing organization. So a little bit about the other two areas of planning water resources and then water supply. Two more slides, including this one. Um, the core of our water resources planning work is our monitoring and assessment group. We monitor rivers, lakes, and streams in partnership with local communities, watershed organizations, and state agencies to guide planning and implementation in the region. A significant number of the region's waters are impaired. Um, and effective implementation has resulted in steady water quality improvement over many years. Current efforts include reusing stormwater to better utilize drinking water supplies and to improve water quality. Um, water supply plan. Um, the Met Council supports local water suppliers in their planning efforts. We are not a drinking water supplier. We do not intend to be a drinking water supplier. The region has abundant surface and groundwater sources, but there are many challenges. We support eight local water supply working groups with participation from the Met Council and from state agencies, and over 50 local water suppliers are represented in these groups. Uh, they collaborate on local issues with our support and with support from the state's Clean Water Fund. Uh, current work includes improving water use efficiency planning for a new water supply options in the north and west, and improving the information available for planning. Uh, Burnsville and Savage are an early success story of this approach, um, where they faced a, a shortage of groundwater due to a well permit restriction. The DNR is the regulator uh, for groundwater, and they found an innovative way to use water from a quarry um, instead of the wells that they no longer had access to. And that model of local collaboration has uh, been developed further around the region now, with now eight groups um, working together to solve those unique local issues that differ across the region. So there will be more about planning over the months to come. Um, the rest of this briefing focuses on wastewater operations. And Mike Moranis, I'll get it to you, Mike. Thank you, Sam. Yep. Mr. Chair, Committee members, I am going to just fly at maybe a 5,000 foot level here just to introduce you to our system. Um, as said by Janine and Sam, would love to take in a deeper dive, would love to get you out to our facilities. Really touring our facilities is the best way to get your arms around um, the complexity uh, of our system. talked a lot about the interceptor system today on previous business items. So I won't repeat too much, but uh, again, 610 miles of interceptor pipe, bringing the flow from the 109 communities. And within those communities, just for a perspective, there's about 5,000 miles of collection sewer that those communities uh, own and operate. In addition, and as far as the size of pipes, some of the pipes coming to, say, the metro plant are large enough that you can drive a car through them. So we're, we're talking some good-sized pipes here, but they need to handle a lot of flow. 
in addition to just the pipes, we have 60 lift stations. So we love to use gravity to move our flow along. There's times geography gets in the way and we need to have a pumping station that basically lifts the flow up over the hill so that we can, can keep it moving along. We also have over 200 meter stations across the metro area. Our services to our cities, we need to have accurate accounting for the flow that each individual city sends us, and our meter station or our meter system allows us to do that. And we have a dedicated staff of over 40 people that are involved with the operations and maintenance of the collection system. Just one picture for you, just the Hopkins lift station. Again, we have 60 some lift stations. They can be very mechanically complex. Most of them include their own odor control units. And again, we'd love to get you out to uh, see some of these firsthand. We'll run through the eight wastewater treatment plants that we own and operate right now. And again, relatively quickly. So the East Bethel plant is located in northern Anoka County. It's our newest and smallest plant. It's been in operations approximately five years or so. Uh, a few specifics about it. It only takes one operator to operate that plant. They're doing that generally just weekdays. So the other hours, uh, the plant is being remotely monitored from some of our 24/7 plants. And again, if a, if a problem crops up, we'll call in the uh, we'll call in an operator. As far as the capacity goes, a couple things I'll say, and then I won't have to repeat them. But when we say the capacity in this case is equal to 0 0.5 million gallons per day, the capacity there is we look at it. It's it's an engineering. Um, term and it really reflects what is the basically the yearly average capacity to that plant. We recognize that the flow varies to the plant so in this case the, the actual flow of the plant's quite low it's uh, it's uh, well it's really about 50,000 gallons a day but the flow again could vary to the plant might actually exceed the 0.5 million gallons for a short period of time and the plant can handle that. But, we, we rate them on the annual average capacity. The St. Croix plant, again, I highlighted that as one of the ones that we have some flood concerns with. So that plant's rated at 5.8 million gallons a day. And again, right now coming into the plants, just a little over 3 million gallons a day. For reference, it's located south of downtown St. Paul and it's just north of the new uh, bridge. You could actually look down from the bridge onto the plant. What did I say? Sorry. It's been a long time up here. <laughs> South of Stillwater. Thank you, Janine. That plant has about four to five operators. Again, they're primarily just working during the day hours, and at night it's unattended and remotely monitored. Uh, and it discharges to the St. Croix River. The Eagles Point plant, this is located in Cottage Grove. It serves mainly Woodbury and Cottage Grove area. Um, again, you can see what, uh, what it's rated at and its average daily flow right now. There's about 10 operation staff there. Uh, again, this plant is not attended at night, but is remotely monitored. And it, dis it discharges to the Mississippi. The Hastings plant, relatively small plant for us. Again, I won't repeat the capacity or the daily flow there. It serves Hastings and the surrounding area. We have an operating staff of about four people there, unattended at nights, um, and discharges to the Mississippi. Mr. Chair, I just Please. wanted to come. Can you go back to the, the slide? So the Hastings plant is right on the edge of downtown Hastings. And this picture is old. There's, it looks like there's a vacant lot with some cars parked on it next door. That's actually an apartment building now, right on the, the city's riverfront redevelopment that they've had going on. And we've owned land for quite some time to move that plant, but we're squeezing every dollar out of it and keeping it in use as long as it meets the capacity and treatment needs rather than prematurely building a new plant. But Someday that's going to have to move and we're ready for that. 
Yeah, I'm used to hearing about wastewater treatment plants with plenty of buffers uh, around <laughs> them. Uh, here, not so much. And I imagine odor control is particularly important, especially to those people who live in that apartment complex. Mr. Chair, you're absolutely right. And there's some of our other plants. Uh, you probably couldn't pick it up on the uh, St. Croix Valley plant, but there's a condominium uh, mm -hmm. structure or uh, what do I want to say condominium, a set of condominiums just on the north side of the plant, basically just outside the, uh, the fence line for the plant. And odors is uh, an extreme um, of importance to us. There's a, there's a, Excel substation near this area too, is there not? Because I've talked, to, I've talked to city council members about um, their desire to move this very, this pretty decent size uh, Excel substation. And do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, I, I can't think tell you exactly I where, but I, I've, in my mind's eye, Mr. Chair. Yes. So what's the time frame for possibly? making the move. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council, we will be starting our planning process most likely this fall. So very preliminary planning process. Um, and then we'll move into, we'll prepare a facility plan, which will require a public hearing, public outreach, and then we'll move into um, the design process. So we're, we're planning to work, start working on this this fall because it takes a, a probably up to five years to begin the design construction and finally commissioning. Thank you. You bet. I believe I covered Eagle's Point. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going the wrong direction. That's why it's looking <laughs> familiar. The Empire Plant. The Empire Plant's located in Farmington. And uh, Mr. Chair, you'll notice there's a quite a bit of buffer around this plant. This is more out of an, in an agricultural area. Uh, it's a rather large plant for us. It serves Farmington, Lakeville, Apple Valley, New Market, that kind of area. Again, because it's a large plant, this is a 24-7 operation for us. We have about 20 operators there uh, that cover the shifts throughout the week, and it discharges to the Mississippi. Our Seneca plant is located in Egan and serves mainly Egan, Burnsville, and Bloomington. Again, it's a relatively large plant. There's about 25 operation staff uh, that man a 24-7 uh, operation there. It discharges to the Minnesota River. The Blue Lake plant, we talked about that a little bit with the flood. Again, a large plant. Um, serves the western communities around Lake Minnetonka um, and out in that area. It's um, as I pointed out, it's located in Shakopee, not far from Valley Fair. There's about uh, 25 to 30 operation staff at that plant. And again, it's a 24-7 operations for us, and it discharges to the Minnesota River. Our largest plant by far is the Metro plant, our largest and oldest plant. It's uh, 81 years in uh, service now for us, and it's located south of St. Paul. It serves Minneapolis, St. Paul, and 60 other uh, surrounding communities. There's about 290 people that are based at the plant, uh, providing a variety of services. Um, and again, as you might expect, we're a 24-7 operation and we discharge to the Mississippi. I'll just talk a little bit about compliance. In our business, uh, one of the ways that uh, we determine the quality of our service is how well we're treating the wastewater and are we doing it in accordance with uh, the requirements that are laid out for us. So in our case, the Minnesota Pollution Control Association issues permits that clearly spell out how well we need to treat the wastewater and then how to demonstrate that. Um, I, what I will say, so let, let me point out, talk a little bit about the slide here. So the y-axis is the number of years of perfect compliance with our uh, discharge permits. And on the x-axis is the names of the various facilities. And you can see that uh, in some cases for Hastings, we've had 28 consecutive years, uh, St. Croix Valley, 27, et cetera. Let me talk a little bit more about that. But 
uh, uh, permit requirements are not easy to comply with, even though you're seeing years and years of perfect compliance. Um, if you take a look at our permits, there's really, in some cases, thousands of opportunities during the course of a year to get tripped up. It's not only about the quality of the water that's leaving the plant, it's how do you demonstrate that. So you're, you're required to take samples at certain locations and certain frequencies. You're required to analyze those samples in a certain way so that the PCA has got confidence in the data that we're providing them. You're required to submit reports on certain deadlines. Any one of those um, portions of the process that isn't done well, you're out of compliance with your permit. So it, again, for some people, they might think it looks easy with this kind of performance. It is not, and all I can do to maybe highlight that is there's six plants on there and we operate eight plants. So I always tell people it's the proverbial, it could be one bad shift, one bad day, and you could uh, uh, violate a permit requirement and you'll get knocked out of your perfect compliance. What I will say is that the seventh plant on here has had four years of perfect compliance. Um, the association that we're involved with, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, recognizes um, excellent performance for sanitary districts like ours. And one of their awards is the Platinum Award. And again, it's for five or more consecutive years of perfect compliance. These six plants are in that category. Um, and again, the seventh plant, I would anticipate in the next year or so that they will also um, achieve the Platinum Performance. The eighth plant is our newest plant up in Anoka County. And we're still working the bugs out of that plant. So we had one violation in the last year. Um, and obviously knocks us out of the consecutive years category. Mr. Chair. Council member. If I remember correctly, the Hastings plant is fourth in the country for longest continuous compliance. That is correct. There's just a handful of plants that have more years of consecutive compliance. Yes. Lisa and I go around and talk to our employees and um, share our, uh, our recognition with them for that kind of performance, and we talk about that. I think it's three plants now that have a longer uh, streak of consecutive compliance. So this is an impressive uh, uh, performance by our plants, but again, I want people to take away this is not an easy performance for our plants. Thank you. I think Mike has one more slide, and that's about the people that um, we have. We have over 600 employees that, rep that work in various trades, professional associations, professional um, capacities that help us. And as I mentioned earlier, again, the number is 600. Um, it's a diverse group and one that works very hard and takes their work very um, seriously. So how do we pay for all of this? Uh, my section is on financing the regional wastewater system. Typically, this would be Ned Smith, who I promise you is a little bit funnier than I am, but I'm going to give it a go tonight and try to get through these slides. So the foundation of our success is that our statutory authority gives the Metropolitan Council unrestricted authority to establish and collect fees to pay for our regional wastewater system. That's um, that's. That is different than the rest of the services that the council provides. The council is accountable, however, to our customer communities and our industries, and that's why we work so hard in environmental services at customer service. And you'll hear over the course of years our customer level of service for our understanding and our agreement with our customers about how they expect us to perform, how they expect our facilities to operate within their communities. And I also want to recognize that Metro Cities, who um, is an advocacy and support group for the, for the cities in the region, uh, works with us quite often to deal with some of the stickier issues that we oftentimes face and that require um, input from our customer communities. I should note also by statute and by policy, MCS wastewater fees and revenues cannot be used 
for other non-wastewater purposes that the council has, including transit, housing, and parks, or those types of things. Um, whoops, excuse me. So here is for 2019, our revenue sources and municipal wastewater charge, which is the charge <clears throat> allocated to customer communities based on each community's share of the total system flow. So Mike mentioned that we have 200 metering stations. Those metering stations document the wastewater flow attributed to each community. 77% um, of our uh, revenue comes from our customer communities, so the cities pay 77% of our um, revenue. Then we have industrial charges that are charged um, to our industries for high strength waste that exceeds domestic wastewater uh, strength, and that's about uh, 4%. Um, we also have the sewer availability charge, which is collected from the cities to pay for wastewater system capacity de demand as um, development occurs. Some of the other sources include state bond fund appropriations for pass-through grants for public infrastructure II mitigation, water supply planning and water quality monitoring. Uh, we get some uh, tax funds from council from the council for typically for demonstration projects and for water supply planning. And then we also use some of our reserve funds. So the majority of our revenue is to be for service. Our expenditures, um, as you can see on the chart, over half of our expenditures are paid for operations, maintenance, chemicals, and services provided um, to the regional uh, to the regional administrator's office, including um, tasks such as HR, risk, the Office of General Counsel, communications, those types of services. And the other half, about 46%, is used to pay for debt service um, associated with our capital program. So this is the chart that we um, in environmental services really take pride in. Uh, in 2018, the average household in the Twin Cities paid only $274 a year for wastewater service. I think that's pretty remarkable when you think about um, the, the bills that, um, and affordability, the discussion of affordability. So that $274 a year is the average across the metro, and that includes the city utility fees. So, tip, so what happens is, is that we pass, we give these the cities um, our bill for the year. They incorporate it into their utility fee, and they set the utility fee and collect it from the homes and businesses in their community. And generally, the MCS utility fee is about 50% of what a city might pay, um, might receive in, in revenue from their, uh, from their residents and businesses. So on to this chart, our rates are some of the best in the country. So Mike talked about our performance, um, and that said our rates are some of the best. Uh, this graph is from the 2017 NACWA survey and it's 2016 data. The rates shown here are retail rates we are the fourth lowest of the 28, um, tw excuse me, 23 peer agencies that report to NACWA. Uh, those agencies are those that serve over a million people a year. And MCS is 40% lower than the average rate of $468 across the nation. So we're 40% lower than the average rate. And again, I believe that uh, Ned will talk to you a little bit more, and he'll also bring in uh, Kyle Colvin, who will talk to you a bit about how the municipal wastewater charge is calculated for each community. So on to the capital program. Um, the capital program has three main goals, and we'll take a deeper dive into this in, in late um, April. First of all, it's to preserve assets. $7 billion worth of infrastructure requires an annual investment into our, um, into our asset management program. We need to ensure that our wastewater system continues to meet, um, to meet uh, uh, growth, regional population growth. Council Member Wolf asked the question when the Newport plan was approved, do their, does the, is the plan consistent with the regional wastewater system? Do we have adequate capacity? And we constantly keep an eye on that because one of our high level of customer service is that we never want to tell a community that they can't 
implement the growth that they want to see in their community because there's not adequate wastewater service. Uh, that would be something that we would not want to do. And we also work to improve the quality and the optimization of their system. The project that Renee talked to you about today, the Wi-Fi project, is an optimization program. So I mentioned a little bit about our, um, I skipped a slide, about our um, capital program drivers. There's six of them. I mentioned business process improvements. I also want to call out infrastructure coordination. We work very hard at working with MnDOT, all of the counties, and all of the communities. If they have a road or a highway project, we want to make sure that we're part of the project, improving our system um, along with their project so that we don't come in behind. So we will work very hard at the project coordination aspect. We also work on environmental sustainability improvements, including things such as um, resource recovery, wastewater reuse. We have a project at the Metro plant where we want to treat our effluent so that we can use that effluent in our um, process uh, as, as part of our process improvements so that we can reduce the impact and the, the reduce the use of clean water in our wastewater uh, treatment process. Uh, we also have improvements associated with customer service. Mike mentioned odor control. We're always working on odor control facilities. And as you see some of the redevelopment in the communities, some of the areas that you never saw redevelopment now are becoming more intense with uh, residential. That increases our need to become better at odor control. Uh, performance assessment in terms of safety, reliability, and then condition assessment. Adam, when he was here today, he talked about our condition assessment program for our interceptors. We also do that, and that was on our gravity pipe. We also do that on our force mains. We also have a systematic um, condition assessment program on all of our assets. So here's some pictures that we're going to wrap up with, and this just gives you a taste of what's to come. Um, you're, you're, and you're going to see a number of projects, about 80 million, 80 to 100 million of our 150 million that we spend every year is in the interceptor system. So this, pro this picture is just a picture um, that shows a slip lining project. This is one of the methods that we use to rehabilitate our interceptor system. Um, Mr. Chair, you asked about the conveyance system. The, this is a picture of a conveyance system that was set up in the Phelan Park area to uh, temporarily convey wastewater out of the um, collection system and into an above ground piping system so that we can repair um, that system. We have uh, some of these in place just over in St. Paul on the Beltline project. Uh, so again, we'd be happy to show you. Um, the reason that this is so deep is that the pipe is about 25 feet deep. So these are very um, big structures that we have to put in in order to temporarily convey uh, the wastewater. Mr. Chair? Please. When are we going to have the big pipes like that in Minneapolis for their big project? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Wolf, that project is out to bid. The bid opening, um, uh, <coughs> Council Member Wolf is talking about uh, the RO4, the Minnehaha Park area sewer improvements, I believe, and that project is out to bid. And we should see those pipes in the area probably late fall. And those are going to be very, very big pipes. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a this is a shot of a, inside of an, um, a tent, an inversion, a, a tent that is used to uh, lay out the um, cast in place or the cured in place uh, pipe. This is a trenchless rehabilitation method that's used to re repair existing pipelines. It's joint jointless, seamless. It builds a pipe within a pipe, um, and and it allows us to rehabilitate pipes ranging in diameter from from basically four inches to about 110 inches. And the largest pipe that we've rehabilitated using this type of methodology is 96 inches. It's the facility that runs right by the uh, Minneapolis Water Treatment Plant, and it conveys wastewater from the North Metro area through Fridley and Brooklyn Park. Um, Mike showed you the picture of the Hopkins, uh, the Hopkins uh, lift station as it's near completed. This is a picture of uh, 
of, of the caisson for that facility being sunk. Um, our interceptors are usually quite deep and located near shallow groundwater. In this photo, we've, um, we've, we're sinking a caisson that is part of the lift station. We wanted to minimize the amount of uh, dewatering necessary to build the caisson because we didn't want to damage adjacent structures. And so the contractor had to use some creative methods to work within the, the caisson uh, so that, uh, so he floated uh, a pontoon inside and mm. so that he could work within the caisson and continue to make progress on the project. And the last project I wanted to show you because you'll be seeing a business item on this as well. This is a picture of, of one of our incinerators at the Metro plant. We have three incinerators at the Metro plant. We have a project where we plan to build a fourth incinerator and then rehabilitate incinerators one, two, and three, which have been in service for just under 20 years. And so um, that project will be coming before you because we will be built, um, presenting a contract for owner's agent representation. We plan to do this as a design build project. So more to come on the capital program. With that, I know the hour is late, but if you have questions, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer. That's okay. It's all super fascinating information yeah, and is. very well presented. We appreciate it a great deal. Any, any further questions? Thank you, Chair. I had a quick question related to the uh, sewer rates. So it's 2016 retail sewer rates per household. So that's for residential. Um, are we equally as competitive uh, on the industrial front? Um, Madam Chair, and, or excuse me, Mr. <laughs> Chair, members okay. of the council, we had eight years of Madam Chair. So um, Mr. Chair and members of the council, I would need to check in and perhaps the general manager could respond to that. But we may have to check in and get back to you on that. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll add that you're going to get a presentation on our budget, and there will be a lot of detail in terms of how the rates are figured out and, and how we do with industries. But um, we're finding the industries pretty happy with us. I don't think they would say that they're paying an inordinate amount of fees. And it's all really rated similar to the domestic. It's just that they have higher strength, so they have to pay you know, more as a result of that. Thank you. Great question. Other questions? No. <laughs> Member Wolf. Just thank you. I'm sorry to beat a dead horse here and drag this meeting <laughs> on forever, but we've, we're also working with some of our highest strength industrial uh, customers to do on site pre processing of the waste to re reduce the strength that comes to us so it saves both energy and money for them and for us. Very good. Other questions? Thank you. Thanks again. And that takes us to the general manager's report. And given the hour, I just want to uh, make this brief, but also reassure you that this is not typical. We <laughs> usually take this long with our agendas. Um, but tonight was a bit was uh, we covered a lot of bases. If you were thinking about this like a meal, it's kind of a smorgasbord we gave you, so you got a little taste of a lot of things. Um, but what, what I do want to leave you with is we want to make sure we give you what you need to do your jobs and feel like you can be effective. So we will be doing informational items at a fairly regular pace, but we're going to try and give them to you kind of just in time. So not give you a bunch of information before you need to actually apply it to your decision makings. But um, we're all very open to your asks. So I'm going to give you my business card. If there's something that you've heard about or you came here interested in the work that we're doing and are anxious to hear about sooner, we certainly can tee something up earlier or we can make sure that you can, can get that information. And uh, we also really want to work with you on how do we do these tours? So, you know, maybe we could even have a meeting at one of our facilities. And so part of the meeting, since they're typically not this long, could be including a tour. And, um, you know, we're waiting for a little better weather and not so much water, but <laughs> I think we're going to probably have some good weather this season to get you out and see those as well. So any thoughts on that, just let me know and we'll try and factor that into our planning. But nice first meeting. Thank you all for being here and showing your support. We're looking forward to working with you all.
Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to those tours as well. I've been to a couple of the, of the plants and it's just, I mean, it's fascinating to hear about it, but it's super fascinating to actually see it with your own eyes. Um, so I think that's a great idea.